Hello. Um, welcome to the virtual presentation about the family map, uh, what I'm calling a guide to our resources. Uh, Virginia Satir, um, it was the person who created this version of um, creating a map of your family so that you're better able to uh, understand where our resources come from, to understand the patterns of behavior in our own family, and to provide insight into who our family members are or were as separate people from their roles. And what that means is that uh, sometimes as, as children, you know, we, when we're growing up, we only see our mother and father and siblings and aunts and uncles, et cetera, grandparents in relation to us. We, we don't really ever learn, learn to know them as individual human beings on the face of the planet. So um, when we do the family map, we do it for the purpose to build understanding about our own resources that we have now that we learned in the families that we grew up in. So this is the purpose of the family map. And I'm going to uh, walk you through uh, a map of my own family. So you'll get an idea of how to do a map if you want to do one for yourself. And you're welcome to uh, do it as we go along here, or if you're watching this as a recorded version, uh, you're welcome to uh, just get a piece of paper and try to draw out a family map following the directions as we go along. And if any, any of you are joining just by audio today, um, you may want to look at the recorded version later because it's going to help you to understand uh, some of the things that I'm talking about. And some of the examples I have here of family maps, of course, you're not going to be able to see. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to show you, here's an example of a family map. And just when you look at it, um, you get a certain impression of something. And Part of doing a family map is inviting the star or the person whose family you're exploring to create a metaphor for their family. And in this case, at the top, you can see that the metaphor is Spider-Man. And when this client looked at the map that she had drawn of her own family, it made her think of spider webs and spider man. And so that's why uh, that she gave it that title. She also looked at the metaphor for uh, on her mother's side of the family. Uh, the metaphor she came up with was messed up. That's that when she looked at the family as a whole, she looked at her, I should say her father's family it was messed up. When she looked at her mother's family, uh, now I can't really read the metaphor there at the top for the, uh, for her mother's family. But those of you who can see the, the family map that I'm looking at will see a lot of very strong lines between all of the the parents and the uh, children in the family. And that indicates very strong relationships all together. So um, there's a very close connection between the people on that side of the family. On the father's side of the family, um, you can see a lot of uh, smaller lines and a lot of very jagged lines, which indicate conflict between members of the family. And that conflict was passed on to the actual uh, family that the star of this map uh, grew up in. Okay, I'm gonna show you another one just for comparison to see what a different map would look like. 
And this map, the metaphor that the uh, client gave for the overall combination of the father's family of origin, the mother's family of origin, and the family of origin that um, the star or the client grew up in, the overall metaphor was orphanage. So when, when she looked at the whole picture of uh, her map, that's what it made her think of, an orphanage, which it's a very powerful metaphor. And it would mean a lot, of, a lot of the same things to a lot of us and maybe some different things. But the um, mother's family, uh, the metaphor that she came up with for this family was a blanket. And that's a very comforting image it's a very warm and uh, secure and safe uh, image. And the other family, the metaphor was an island on an ocean. Again, a very powerful metaphor of both isolation and uh, being alone, surrounded by water, a lot. We can learn so much by looking at these maps once they're done. In this, this example, we also see a lot of jagged lines connect, going between the different family members and a lot of broken lines. And this, ex, this represents high levels of conflict and uh, broken relationships. Uh, in fact, the image, the metaphor that uh, this client came up with for the, her family of origin was, or his family of origin, I should say, was a broken blender. That was the image that came to his mind when he was describing the family of origin that he grew up in. So you see the, uh, the power of these metaphors just in themselves and that, that's only one part of doing the family map. Uh, there's many more parts which I'm going to review uh, with you today. I'll just show you one more map. And uh, this, again, this is a, uh, no, I don't see the metaphors in here so much. But uh, in this map, it's a very complicated map. Uh, there have been several marriages and many children uh, from uh, both of them of small nuclear family in the family of origin, but a large number of aunties and uncles. And in this case, you can see that there has been a, so much death in the family of origin. And we represent that by crossing out the um, the circle or the square that represents the family member. So those are just a few examples. And um, I'm going to show you another slide here, which is a, a picture of two sisters. And uh, I like this picture because these are my own two daughters when they were little. But um, I just, uh, it, it, to me, they represent uh, so many so many parts of their character are represented by this picture and you know if, if when they the, of course they're grown up now but um, if they ever wanted to do their family map and they look into where did they learn uh, who they are where did they learn about relationships where did they learn about themselves I think um, thinking about a picture like this uh, looking at the younger one, this is her with a bottle in her mouth, and which was her security blanket, and which she kept to a very old age, considering, although not, uh, not so old from uh, a Chilean nanny's point of view. But anyway, and the other one, the older girl, is sitting here with her finger on her forehead, questioning, cu looking curious. Uh, trying to understand things and uh, 
This is part of her character too. So we're looking at, um, you know, so many parts of the character that come out in family pictures that if we want to understand ourselves and um, more about who we are, um, who our parents were as human beings, uh, there's a lot to be learned from doing a family map. Okay, so in this, um, what I thought I would share with you today um, is, uh, is my own family that I grew up in. And <clears throat> when we're using the family map to understand ourselves better, we look at three generations. So I don't look at my own uh, my own family, my own nuclear family of myself, my, I have two ex-husbands uh, and two daughters, one from each husband. I don't look at my generation of, uh, we don't look at that. We lo look at the family of origin that I grew up in. So this is my family of origin and I'm gonna go through it with you step-by-step step how you would create your own family map. And if you wanna do it as we go along, that's terrific. If you're not able to do it, I really encourage you to do it at some time and really see how you can build understanding and appreciation for all the people in your family as distinct human beings, not just as your mother or your grandfather or your sister, or your auntie, your uncle. So this is how you do it. You start by uh, using a shape to represent uh, your mother and father. So we all have a mother and father. Now, some of us are adopted. Some of us have uh, more than one mother. Uh, we have stepmothers. We have stepfathers. So those could all be added into the picture as well. But in my case, I had one mother and one father. And so I use a circle to represent a female and my mother, Marion, was, and we put the birth date and the date of death by year. So Marion, 1922 to 2010, that was my mother's uh, life. And since she passed away, we put an X through her circle. And um, I see that these lines have moved on me a little bit. So I'm gonna just fix them up. So uh, for my uh, father, my father's name was Gordon. Uh, he went by his middle name of Gordon, and he was born in 1922, same year as my mom. And he died two years after, well, actually a year and a half after my mom died in 2012. And there's, I, I show a line uh, between them here that, uh, that just mentions that they were married in 1945. So, and they stayed married their whole adult lives and um, were married when mom passed away. And uh, my dad never considered uh, remarrying at his age. Uh, he was, uh, let's see, 88. 88, I believe, when mom, mom passed away. Anyway, so we put their marital status there when they got married, and if they had happened to be divorced, then we would draw a line through that line that connects them and just put divorced in whatever year. Or if they were separated, we'd put separated. Okay, so um, that's where we start. And then we draw a line down to their, the children that they had together. So in this case, and again, we use a circle to represent girls and uh, squares to represent boys. And we put a star around the client or the star of the family map. In this case, it's myself. So 
you can see from this map that um, um, Gordon and Marion had a child, Julie, who lived from 1947 to 1949. Uh, she was what they called at that time a blue baby, and they knew that she had a hole in her heart and that she would never live very long. It still must have been a terrible, um, terrible uh, sorrow to lose their first child. And they did lose that child when my mom was pregnant with my oldest sister that I remember, Susan, and she was born in 1950. I was born 13 months later in 1951. And my sister, Marg, the next one was born in 1953. My next sister, Barb, was born in 1954. My mother experienced two miscarriages, which we put onto the map, one in 1955, one in 1956. And then my brother, Bob, the prince came along, uh, the only boy in the family in 1957. So just looking at that uh, historical pattern, we, we already know a lot of things. We know that um, in the 1950s, my mother was like most other women, having lots of children and very close together. And I've worked with lots of women over the years who have said that they, you know, all these years of childbearing and being pregnant or breastfeeding are, they just are like a blur. There'd be 10 years are like a blur. And, and I look in my own uh, family of origin and I can see that from the time my mom had her first child, it, in 1947 uh, to when she had her last child, Bob, in 1957, there's 10 years. So that doesn't even count the years of, or the months of pregnancy with Julie, but there's 10 years. And where I think my mother's life must have been quite a blur with all of these children and uh, all of the, you know, responsibilities that came with being a traditional 50s housewife. So already we learn a lot about my mother's life and just from seeing those parts. And when we look, we, in the map, we put a few things down beside, um, beside um, where my mother's uh, circle is. And uh, well, these are the things that I mentioned about her. She's a small town prairie girl. She was born in a very small farming town, you know, a couple of hundred people. Um, her parents moved around a lot, as I know. I think it was, uh, you know, the uh, years leading up to the Depression and um, that my grandfather took all kinds of work, he could, whatever work he could get. He was a carpenter, he worked in grain elevators, he uh, flipped houses, he did a number of things as I learned later on. But my mom, she was also the first woman, I think the first person from her little town to ever go to university and she achieved a science degree at the University of Manitoba in 1943, the same year as my dad graduated and that's where they met at university. Uh, Marion was also a, an athlete, uh, competed at the university level, was a wonderful diver and swimmer until she got Parkinson's at a very young age. And that was in the early 60s. So uh, again, this tells us a lot about the family. We know that, um, you know, when we see in the map that uh, Marion got Parkinson, started to get it uh, around 1962, 63. My brother would have only been six years old. And the oldest child in the family, living child, Susan, would have been maybe 13 years old. And, and I would have been 12. And the other children younger than us would really mostly only remember mom 
as having Parkinson's. Whereas the older children, we remembered mom, you know, out swimming and diving and being very athletic before the Parkinson's came on. So that's, you know, really we learned a lot about um, Marion just from what you've seen so far on this map. Now about Gordon, he was a geologist, a meteorologist. He was born in a city, Winnipeg. Um, he lived in the North all his life as an adult. He worked in, you know, as a geologist do in the mining communities. And he was a tennis player. So was my mom, a tennis player and badminton player. They both played and were really good, really competitive. And dad, uh, he played tennis until he was uh, 89 years old, played tennis three times a week. Uh, so that's these little details. We just, we don't have to put everything about their life, but we put in enough uh, of what was significant. We could have added that uh, during the war, um, the Second World War, because my parents both had university educations and they were not required to serve in the armed forces, but my father had to choose between being a meteorologist, getting trained as a meteorologist or a radio operator. And my mother, in fact, worked as a lab technician in the Vancouver General Hospital. And they got together um, as a couple when they were both living out in BC. So this is uh, significant about how their war years were spent and, and how it impacted their lives. And this would be very different if somebody had been um, uneducated and was called into service and had to go and, and serve overseas in the army or the Navy or Air Force. Uh, but because of my parents, uh, good luck maybe, they, um, they didn't have to do that. They did were expected to contribute according to their uh, skills and they both did that. As soon as the war was over, they got married, 1945. And then from there, they went directly uh, to work in the bush in a small mining camp. Anyway, that's a bit more about my parents' history. You don't have to have everything on the map, but uh, it's, it's, it's good to uh, try to represent the family map as you would have seen it as a child. So, what else do we put onto the map? Well, we put on their coping stance. And for those of you who are familiar with the uh, coping stances that Virginia Satir identified, there's four of them. And the, they, they describe how we react when we're under stress. So normally we, uh, if we're defensive, we, we go to one of these four defensive coping stances. We can placate, try to smooth everything over. We can be super reasonable like a machine, like a computer, and we know the rules and we're rational and logical and we ignore our feelings. Well, both my parents were in that category of super reasonable, super rational people, uh, did everything by the book, um, denied their feelings really my my father until he was in his 80s i think he denied that he even had certain feelings you know, he said yeah, i just didn't feel that and he didn't notice that marion had certain feelings either even when we questioned him about that and we said well that you know of course when marion lost her first child at a year and a half old, of course, she would be devastated. She would be deep in grief, any mother would. And I remember Gordon saying, oh, I don't remember anything about it. I never saw her crying about it or anything. Well, my belief is that Marion would have hidden that from Gordon, that she would have done her crying in the rain or done her crying 
uh, when Gordon was away, which he was away a lot. His job took him away for months at a time to the bush and, uh, and mom was on her own with all of these kids. So uh, being super reasonable, rational uh, is, uh, was the way that Gordon coped and also the way that Marianne coped. And that was her style of doing things. And uh, I think this is why part of why the metaphor that came to me to describe this family with doing the right thing in their mind, there were a set of rules about how people should act, how people should parent, how children should behave. There were a lot of rules. And we, when I start to explore this as an adult and look at the kind of rules that I had that were uh, kind of inhuman and uh, imp imprisoning me really, um, I realized a lot of these rules came from my family of origin. and from my parents' fa families of origin too. And that's not to judge them or criticize them. A lot of the rules came from a very good place, you know? When we have a rule like you should never interrupt your elders. Well, that's about respect, isn't it? Uh, and respect is a very, very good quality that most of us would agree that we want to have for other people and we want other people to have for us but comes from a very good place. But if you always have to respect our elders and you can never interrupt our elders, it means that even if our elders are being abusive or even if our elders are harming us, um, we shouldn't say anything. And that's not what we, we want anymore in our lives for our children or for ourselves. But many of us uh, grew up like that. So, okay, so what else have we got in here? Okay, um, by, uh, my sister Susan here was, uh, as I said, 13 months older than me. Uh, she's experienced and does still experience a lot of mental health issues. And in a way, that's her way of coping. Uh, she's experienced depression. She's experienced other forms of mental illness. Uh, me, my form of coping, and, and I've got a little picture here of the, the pleading hands, it's I was the placator. I was the mediator in the family. I was always trying to make peace between people and um, trying to make people feel good. And I hated conflict. So that anytime there was some conflict, I tried to smooth everything over. And then my... Uh, two younger sisters, Marg and Barb, they both became super reasonable like my parents did. And they, they still have that primary defense uh, mechanism to this day. And then looking in the family, the two, my mother did have two miscarriages and uh, one, very close to each other. And then my brother Bob was born in 1957, and as I say, he was the prince, the only boy. Um, my mom had just uh, had two miscarriages, so I'm sure was very happy to have a, a healthy boy, a healthy child altogether. But, um, you know, I think like other people in her generation and my dad's generation, they would really want to have a boy child to carry on the family name and all the other things that uh, go with a patriarchal society, which we are swimming in, of course. And my brother, Bob, he developed a defensive style of irrelevance. And it's pictured here by like a party animal. And uh, that's what my brother did for many years of his life and used drugs and alcohol to, um, to get through the day. And that's had a tremendous impact on him uh, throughout his life. So what I haven't done yet is, well, I, I started to do it, a draw on the relationships between people. And uh, for those of you who can see the map, uh, there's a very solid, thick line between Gordon and Marion. They were always very close and 
always spoke with one voice. Uh, there was no uh, wiggling your way between your parents and playing them off against each other. That never worked in our family. They were too close. Um, and the relationships, um, there was a very actually conflicted relationship, which I'm going to draw here, um, between um, Marion and Susan. And I think that this can might stem back, um, you know, to when uh, um, the oldest daughter, Julie, died while mom was pregnant with Susan and must have been in a terrible state of grief and had trouble attaching and developing a solid attachment with Susan. So their relationship was always conflictual. And maybe as a result of that too, uh, the relationship uh, between Gordon and Susan was strong, very strong. And the theory is that um, because mom wasn't able to be as uh, bonded or as loving towards Susan as she would have wanted to be um, that dad kind of picked up the the slack and he was much closer uh, to her to susan so that relationship was very close um myself i had a very uh, good relationship with both of my parents certainly as a young child my relationship was oops Oh, sorry, I've got to undo that. Oh, I moved that out. Sorry, I've moved my little symbol of myself there. I got to try to move it back where it belongs there. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so you can see how this works that we um, we draw the relationships between everybody and everybody. Um, and if you, I, I'm not going to go through all of it because it take it, you know, may take too much time. But anyway, the um, uh, relationships between yikes. Um, I think we can analyze uh, the relationships between, uh, I would say mom and Bob were <coughs> kind of, I would represent that by a broken line. Because at the time, I, th I believe that mom was very focused on her own, uh, you know, she had a very recent diagnosis of Parkinson's. Uh, it took a few years to get the correct diagnosis. <clears throat> and at that time, she must have been extremely stressed out. And I think the doctors at one point thought she was uh, suffering from depression. So I'm drawing kind of a jagged line there because I think my mom was not in a place where she was able to really give and become attached <clears throat> to Bob. So it's a repetition of a pattern that she had with Susan. And by the time I came along and Marg and Barb came along, mom had recovered from her grief sufficiently that she was able to have a normal attachment with me and Marg and Barb. Um, that's, that's our family belief anyway. Sorry, this keeps jumping around a little bit. Okay, so um, then the next part we do in in this uh, in doing the family map is that we create uh, three adjective whoop, three adjectives. My apologies screen keeps jumping around 
Okay, we'll get over here. So we create three adjectives for each person on the map. And I'll say for Gordon, I would say um, logical, um, kind, smart, um, athletic. I'm going to give him four. Okay, so those are the four I would give to Gordon. And for Marion, I would give her um, three adjectives. She was very sweet. And again, this is how I saw things as a child. And everyone else in the family, if they were doing a map, will, might see it differently. Um, she was very hardworking. And she was very competent. Everything she did, she did really well. No, she was a wonderful cook. She was a wonderful baker. She was a wonderful knitter. She was uh, a wonderful athlete. She Everything she learned to do, she learned to do it really well. So that's a few adjectives about Marion. Uh, Susan, uh, you know, we add some, some adjectives about Susan. I would say she was oops. Why does it keep jumping on me like that? Okay. Okay. Uh, Susan was beautiful. Very stunning, beautiful, stunningly beautiful child and teenager and is to this day. Uh, very insecure. And very disturbed. And these are the adjectives that I would uh, use to describe Susan. And I'm not going to fill out the whole map with everybody in the family, but just uh, because this is this is kind of a hard part for most people uh, to come up with some adjectives for oneself. But I think as a child, I was really cute. I was precocious. And I was funny. And I was clever. Uh, so there's some adjectives for me. Um, again, we could, you know, you can always come up with a long, much longer list of adjectives if you give yourself time. But when you're doing the map, you want to try to um, contain it because it could it could take you all day and all night to uh, come up. I mean, when you get talking about your family, it's very easy to go in hugely deep. So we have to kind of manage um, the information we're going to put on the map. So just to review then, uh, we add the birth date, the date of death, if they've passed away, uh, the date of marriage, uh, their coping stance, three adjectives, a bit of historical data, um, the relationships between all of the people in the map and and then a metaphor uh, we create a metaphor for the whole family and the metaphor i chose was doing the right thing i kind of found a picture of uh, the scales of justice i think doing things right and there was such a clear right and wrong in our family that the rules were very clear uh, to us. 
and and they were kind of black and white. So some of the rules that, um, for example, uh, the family rules, we, we are always ask the clients to try to come up with some family rules. And we know what are family rules because they, um, they always start with, you should always do something or you should never do something. So uh, some of the rules, um, you should never lie. That, there's one example. You sh should always finish what you start. You should never interrupt. Um, lots of rules. I've done a lot of work on these family rules over the years. And one of the exercises we could do, and maybe we'll do that in another session someday, is turning family rules into guidelines. Because it's a very important work, especially those of us who grew up in a kind of black and white family and we learned that, you know, you should always do this, you should never do this. It is, um, those can become very inhuman uh, rules for us to try to follow. And as I said, they always start at a good place, um, but there, if, if there's no exceptions, then we can beat ourselves up and never feel good enough, never feel that we're doing a good enough job. So we can talk about that more later if, if anybody wants to. Uh, so there's lots of rules and you can come up with, if you start thinking about them, you, you can come up with a million. Uh, uh, you should always uh, take your fair share. Yeah. And I, I would definitely remember this as a child, you know, if there, if there were, uh, you know, on, can, our parents bringing candy into the house was a very rare experience when we were young. But if they brought in a, a bag of candies or something, that we were expected to count them out and make sure that we only took the right number that would mean that everybody got the same amount. And there was a real judgment if somebody took more than their share. And uh, so this is an important value about sharing that uh, our parents wanted to teach us. And there's nothing wrong with uh, sharing fairly. But there may be times when maybe somebody doesn't like those candies as much as the other person and, and they, they could have more and it wouldn't be the end of the world. And some people would be happy to give up some of theirs. So, you know, things are not always black and white. And I think this is the danger of family rules, which become like a prison. Okay, so um, that's an example of the family rules. And when you get started thinking about family rules, if you're like me, you can come up with many pages of family rules. And it's really worth the effort to change those rules into guidelines. And again, that's something we'll look at in another, in another session. So let me tell you how you use this family map then um, to gain your resources. What we do with clients when I help them prepare their family map or they work in small, if I'm working with a group, I get everybody to do their family map and work in groups of three. And one person who is the star doesn't have to write. There'll be a writer who will draw out the map and there'll be the other person who asks the questions to keep the process moving. 
because again, every family is beautiful. Every family is fascinating. You could ask a million questions and gossip about any family all day long, but that's not, that's not the job of a family map is to get some key information. So when I talk about resources um, and how the family map is very useful in identifying resources, I invite people to look at the adjectives we used to describe the members of our family. And I would ask the client, okay, starting over here with Gordon, logical. I would ask the client, do you know what it's like to be logical? Are you, are you sometimes logical? And they'll say yes. And if they wanna say no, you say, well, do you know what it's like to be logical? Can you imagine being logical? They say yes. Okay, are you kind? Yes, I can be. Are you smart? Maybe people want to own that resource or maybe they don't. But if they don't, then you can ask them, are, do you, can you imagine being smart? Or do you know what being smart would be like? Yeah. Athletic. All of these qualities are actually resources. We know how to do them all. We've seen them growing up in our families. We know what a sweet person looks like. We know what a hardworking person looks like. We know what a competent person looks like. So these are all resources we can access for ourselves if we want to grow, if we want to make some kind of change. And even the, these qualities that um, you know were related to my sister Susan, beautiful. Do we ask the client? Do you do you know what it's like to feel beautiful? And maybe they do, maybe they don't. Well, then we ask them, can you imagine what it might be like? Um, insecure, do you ever feel insecure? Yes. Of course, we all feel insecure sometimes. And insecurity, is a, it's a signal to ourselves that we need to pay attention to something. And when we're disturbed, it's a signal. It, it's a useful signal uh, that something's going on that we need to pay attention to. So we go through all of the adjectives and don't forget there were many more that I left off this list um, in this example, to just, it, just because of time. And I want us to have time to discuss <coughs> what you've seen in the family map uh, before we uh, run out of time today. So the, these are all our, our resources and also the, our coping stances, um, being super reasonable and logical. Uh, this is a resource that we saw in our parents and we, I saw in two of my siblings. And this is something I know how to be. I can use that when I want to, even though my main thing that I learned was to be a peacemaker. And that has turned into a wonderful career for me. And as I've you've been able to create peace and harmony many times and not fight over small things. And, um, you know, uh, people who are placators are very good to have on committees because you help resolve conflict or disputes and uh, also the hard working part, the competent part, these are all wonderful qualities that, that I know all about as a person who grew up in this family of origin. I learned all of this. And, you know, some people grew up in families where there was a lot of conflict and they would have learned different things that they can use. Um, I had a very structured, and very happy family childhood growing up in my family. I feel very blessed to have had that experience and I don't, uh, I don't forget it for a minute. And, you know, tried to bring those qualities of hardworking and competence and being sweet in my own family in my, to raise my children in that way. And this um, idea of doing the right thing, I, I try to do that still. I, I think 
there's a lot of value in trying to do the right thing. But I sometimes make mistakes and there wasn't much room for mistakes in our family growing up. So that was something I had to learn what not to do. I had, I had to learn to be more forgiving, to be more, create more freedom, that there's a lot of shades of gray between the black and white of right and wrong. And, you know, I also learned to be a, a judgmental. I learned to be a judge, um, like my parents were, that everything will either fit into good or bad. And there wasn't anything in between. So I had to unlearn that. I had to learn that there were lots of shades of gray. Yeah. So that's the map. And, you know, when I'm wondering, okay, well, where did that come from? Where, how come I'm like this? How come I have that um, insecurity sometimes? Or uh, why do I, uh, why am I disturbed about something um, at times? I can look at my family and see where that where I learned that. Where did that come from? I can see it. And when a client looks at the map of their own family and sees it, they learn so much. And some of it is painful because they've repressed those memories. And some of it is just joyful. But whatever it is, we work on the concept that every family is beautiful, that Everybody in the family was doing the best they could with their awareness and resources. And everyone was doing the best they could. And, you know, you can imagine when we go, we, then we leave this nuclear family, we go to the next step, which is, and again, I'm not going to do it because of time. It's already uh, 20 past two in the Pacific uh, Yukon work time frame. So we want to have a lot of time for discussion. Uh, we look at the paternal family. So we look at, you know, we would look at my father's family and he had a father and he had a mother. And there actually was a, uh, his father. Okay, if my, my father is here and he had a whole bunch of sisters and I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to quickly put the shapes of them in here. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, process that he did with the other family. But um, so this is his, my father's father, the paternal grandfather. And this is um, his first wife. And they had one daughter. And this is his second wife. And they had uh, three, Carrie, Beth, Margie, Peggy, uh, three more daughters, and then my father, and then one more sister. So my dad grew up in a family surrounded by women and with a mother and five sisters and my mother interestingly enough grew up in a family where she was the only girl so it was like a prince and a princess got together and had this royal family that was a kind of image that came to me too but anyway that so you would do the same thing that you did in the map of the nuclear my nuclear family Oops, you would do that for the family that your mother grew up in on, and that your father grew up in. And you would come up with metaphors for all of them, each one of them. And then you would come up with a metaphor for the whole map, which includes, if you're working uh, uh, in person, you can do it on a big piece of flip chart paper, and then you can have the, you know, the father's family of origin up in the top left-hand corner, the mother's family of origin in the top right-hand corner, and then your own family of origin in the middle at the bottom. So you can really get the sense of the shape 
of the family from that, what it looks like. And, you know, you will be able to learn so much from doing this work. And sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's shocking. You'll, you'll remember things that you've forgotten or you'll gain insight into who are your parents as people. Like, what was it like? If you go back to this map, what can you imagine? Um, Marion, for example, 40 years old. She was 40 years old, was 1962. She's got five living children, three children, two miscarriages, one who has died young. Six, seven, eight. So eight children all together, five of them living. And she discovers that she's got Parkinson's disease at the age of 42. We can have a lot of compassion for that woman. And even though as a teenager, we might have felt like we were neglected or, or we had, you know, we, our parents weren't as available to us. When we look at it from the outside now as adults, we can see what their life would have been like. And what was it like for Gordon to have his sweet, hardworking, competent wife get Parkinson's and he knows that you know his life is going to be different and he's going to have to change his uh, he can't be away all the time like he was when he was younger he's going to have to change his career things he's going to have to be a more active parent and pick up in areas where Marion was becoming less and less competent as time goes on so by the time that he retired um which it was when he was 65. So that was 1987. Um, he gradually started to learn how to take care of the house, to cook, to bake, to do laundry, to do everything, and to care for my mom who was at home sick until she died. So, you know, we can look at Gordon and say, okay, what was his life like? You know, what were his expectations? What, what were his hopes and dreams? You know, what did he think of this family he had? Um, you know, with my brother struggling with addictions, with my sister struggling with mental health. Um, how, how, what was his life like? And we can think of him as a man, as a person, not just as my father. And think of him in relation to me and we can usually what happens when people look at their family map is we feel a lot of compassion for everyone in our family you know we can look at what was it like for susan not being attached to her mother as a baby what was it like for Gordon to have to be both parents to Susan because Marion was deep in grief, losing her first child? And then what happened when this bubbly, cute, little precocious, funny kid came along, Pat, and mom was over her grief somewhat enough that she could appropriately attach and bond with Pat and you know, it was entertaining. And so it was very likable, lovable as a child. And so people were happy to have me around. I wasn't, I was easy because I want to make everybody happy. So I would do whatever they wanted to me to do to be, to make them happy. And then these two, Marg and Barb, they were kind of lost in our family, and even in a way to this day, remain somewhat lost. You know, um, when the time that they were growing up, um, because of the Parkinson's, uh, again, my dad was away a lot through work. Um, they were kind of a very close unit together. And they feel like they kind of had to raise themselves. And then 
my brother Bob came in and he was really on his own. And he just, uh, he just said, whatever. And he just uh, coped the best he could. And whenever we think of that now, we might judge his behavior if, he's, if his addictions um, are active, we might judge him for that. But, you know, it's really easy to see, looking at the map, how that kind of thing could have happened and why that was a choice he made. That was his way of coping. That's all. It's not something we need to judge. It's just something we need to try to understand and have compassion for as much as we would want everyone in the family to have compassion for us, whatever our experience was. So the only other thing that I'm going to mention is that you can add into a map if there were a traumas or if there were world events, you know, like a world war, like an earthquake, uh, like an economic crisis, uh, like if somebody lost their job, uh, if there was illness, I did put that in about my mom. Um, and um, yeah, anything that was significant, you know, like uh, contextually, you know, anyone uh, growing up in the depression, that would have an influence on everything in the family. So it would be worth mentioning in the map. Um, you know, to me, it was worth mentioning that my mom was a traditional 50s housewife. To a lot of us, that, that has a whole lot of meaning. And <clears throat> when you say that a traditional 50s housewife, we can think of, uh, you know, um, you know, the Leave it to Beaver family, for those of us who are old enough to recognize that, or, uh, you know, somebody who is a, the wife stays home, looks after the cooking, makes all the meals, keeps the house clean, does all the laundry. And there's not much of an expectation that the husband would do anything in the house other than earn, it's his job to go out and earn money. And the wife would look after everything else. And the husband could play with the kids after dinner, um, you know, if he's not reading the paper or he's not having a nap or smoking a pipe or whatever. But there were just very strict roles for um, uh, husbands and wives in those days. So I think I'm going to leave it there and uh, stop sharing my screen. <coughs> if I can. Uh, yeah, I'll stop the share and uh, bring back, <coughs> bring back the participants. If anybody uh, has any comments or questions about the family map, anything you'd like to share. <coughs> 